Welcome to this uh, last part of morphology and if you remember the last point that we reached last time was the, the another level you know, in linguistics which is morphophonemics it's the combination of morphology and, phono and phonology at the same time now we're going to show this uh, level which is morphophonemics and how it works through two different mo morphemes that you know the first one is the pluromorpheme, which takes this uh, shape S here. This pluromorpheme in English takes different uh, uh, shapes, different realizations that we are going to call allomorphs. So we have got S, Z, is, or schwa and Z, is, and EN and A. So it depends on words, it depends on different cases here. Now morphemes often have surface representations in different contexts. The alternate surface representations of a morpheme are called il its allomorphs. One of the important goals of phonology to is to account for allomorphic alternations. These are the alternations, as, s, z. And these are found to be shared between three different morphemes. The first one is the plural morpheme in English. The second one is the possessive. And the third one is the third person singular, present tense. So these are three different morphemes which have the same allomorphs, which means they are pronounced in the same way in the same in phonetic environments let's look at them glass glasses the plural glasses the possessive s sneezes this is the the third morpheme which is the the third person singular present tense same thing here cat cats cats meets here we have got s as a realization here we have got is or is here we have got z dog dogs dogs it feeds so three different realizations i mean that we obtain according to three different uh, environments or under different conditions okay so the forms as s z occur in different environments or conditions and we're going to explain them in detail So these three different realizations or alternations is s, z. As I said, the first one here is obtained after s, z, sh, j, ch, j. The second one s is obtained after voices consonants other than s, sh, ch because we have got the beer. Z is obtained elsewhere in other contexts. So among these three different pronunciations or realizations or surface representations what is the underlying form among these here is it as s or z the first possibility here to say that z is the underlying form and here we can account for the as endings with an epithesis rule so if we say that z is the underlying form then it has got as a surface representation as in this context here when it is after s z sh j ch j so here we have to account for this addition we add a schwa here this is what we call this uh, what you call a parenthesis rule here we add schwa here before z so this rule will insert a schwa between a stem final plus trident plus coronal sound and the suffix z so these are the sounds which are plus trident plus coronal when we when we have them at the end of words and we want to form the plural out of those words here what do we do we add a schwa we insert a schwa and after schwa we add z here so that's why 
I mean the final that is the plural morpheme is pronounced as is or is so the set of sounds plus strident plus cardinal comprises these ones here and we repeat them here s, z, sh, j, ch, j these are uh, I mean it's a kind of uh, uh, natural class that we call plus trident plus coronal now this epanthesis rule apparently facilitates pronunciation by breaking up clusters of similar or identical consonants b the occurrence of the s in forms such as cats and tops can then be attributed to assimilation of the z to the voicelessness of a preceding consonant notice the word cat what's the final sound of it it's t it's voiceless now this z will automatically become voiceless it becomes s because it is found after voiceless sound same thing here top it becomes tops we don't say tops but we say tops because the final sound of the word is voiceless therefore this z will be changed into its voiceless counterpart okay now this assimilation yields a syllable coda consistent with the universal devoicing constraint which requires that no voice consonants follow a voiceless one in the same syllable coda so just remember the, the I mean the notion of the coda because we explained it in uh, the I mean the uh, section about syllable and uh, of course we know that within the same coda we cannot uh, gather two different sounds as far as voice is concerned we cannot have voice plus voiceless one in the same coda so here I mean there is this what you call universal devoicing constraint okay which governs if you like uh, this uh, uh, change in here we cannot have for example p followed by z so what do we do we assim there is an assimilation process here this z becomes s because it for it is uh, I've been mean, preceded by voiceless sound in here now the forms ending in z of course undergo no change because it it remains itself choosing z as the underlying form allows us to account for all the alternate forms of the morphemes in questions or in question with the rules okay now the second possibility we have finished with the possibility saying that we take z as the underlying form now we are going to take s as the underlying form here we would posit a less natural and less motivated rule than the devoicing rule we have just seen for z we voice s after a voice consonant or vowel although z is a somewhat less natural sound than s the choice of z and the very natural devoicing rule seems preferable to choosing s and a far less nat uh, natural rule here now the third possibility we can f we can choose the the, the third uh, realization which is as so taking this realization as the underlying form would have committed us to a rule of a uh, deletion if we say that s or z are going to be the realization of as therefore we are going to omit a uh, instead of adding it so we, are, we have to account for this uh, to for the deletion of schwa here this sound would be this schwa here would be deleted except when preceded by plus strident plus coronal sound this is what we saw before after a deletion, a z following a voiceless consonant would be devoiced to s, exactly as for the solution which takes z to be the unlined form. So we are, it's the reverse here of z. Here. So we can arbitrarily take z to be the basic form. Now another case of morpheme alternation. We here we are going to uh, consider uh, another morpheme. It's the the past uh, 
uh, tense ending here in English, which takes the uh, ed, the form of ed, which which is uh, I mean if you like pronounced in different ways. These different ways are the surface representations or the allomorphs. So the first one is ed, the second one is de, the third one is te. Okay. Now in examples like padded, tended, here we have ed. Here we have got picked, missed. Here we have got this realization. Here penned, penned, lived. We have got this realization, the. Now let's look. Uh, let's look at their environments where they occur. So we have got ed after t or the. In verbs where we have got the last sound t or the, I mean that past ending is pronounced as ed. This is what we are watching here, tended, padded. Now, the second realization, t, it's obtained after voiceless consonants other than t. Now, d, elsewhere, in other, the other contexts apart from these in here. Now, let's choose again arbitrarily d as the underlying form and then posit rules to account for the other forms. For verbs ending in voice sounds, we need no phonological rule to account for the past participle forms. Okay? Verbs such as bang, rob, for example, become banged and robbed. Here there is no change, simply through the addition of the. Okay? Now, for verbs ending in t and d, such as pat and add, Okay, these uh, cases are subject to an epanthesis rule which inserts a schwa in contexts such as this one here, between t and d, between d and d here. Again, breaking up clusters of similar or identical consonants here. Okay, now for verbs ending in voiceless consonants other than t, however, the addition of the de suffix results in an impermiss impermissible sequence, which means a voiceless obstruent followed by a voiceless one. This is impermissible. Now, the de endings of forms such as work and de and zip and de are therefore changed to te. This de here is j and de here is changed into te because uh, the preceding sound is voiceless here okay so this uh, I mean this uh, I mean if you like uh, realization is obtained because it is found after k and p which are voiceless okay it's changed to t by assimilation to the preceding voiceless sound okay now let's talk about other alternations so, if you like, the alternation of the suffixes are attributed to the phonological nature of the stems to which they are attached. They are phonologically conditioned. Some allomorphs cannot be accounted for phonologically, that is, they are morphologically conditioned. So, these are, uh, I mean, the, the other kinds of uh, allomorphs that we are going to see here. So, for example, the plural morpheme in English has several morphologically conditioned allomorphs. For example, ox becomes oxen, child becomes children. So we have got this en here. It's an, uh, another kind of realization of the plural morpheme in English in some words. Uh, we have got other examples. We have got the word medium. This is the singular. Criterion, the singular. It becomes criteria you know, for criterion, for medium it becomes media. So, if you like, we take part of the word medium, we, we have medi, criteria, in criterion, and we add to it a here, to obtain the plural. So, these are things that we cannot, if you like, explain uh, um, through rules, but these are things that we need to learn by heart, because they are f uh, morphologically conditioned. So, uh, same thing here, after this, uh, the, 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 the singular word is radius, fungus, so we take part of them, here, radi, and it becomes radii. Uh, fungus, it becomes fungi, here. Okay? 
So after radi and fong it becomes radai, here fungi, okay? Now a number of terms such as mouse, goose and man have flows expressed by vowel symbolism. For example in mice, of course we know here we have got the, the, the plural morpheme, but it seems that in fact there is what we call some kind of symbolism through the, the, the vowel, I, instead of ow here, mouse singular here i stands for or symbolizes if you like the plural in this word mice same thing here a as opposed to a in the singular form man as opposed to man here a same thing here e geese instead of u in goose the singular here we have got uh, i mean the plural here in, in these cases is symbolized by different vowels here it's i here it's a here it's e here so, in fact, all these cases are morphologically conditioned. So, uh, we have to stop in here. I mean, uh, as far as morphology is concerned, just try to remember the different, uh, if you like, issues we introduced, I mean, uh, during the, the, the videos that we, I sent to you. Later on, I, we will try to uh, consider some uh, uh, exercises concerning uh, phonetics, phonology and morphology, we are going to share them and to have them as uh, our own basis to prepare for your own exam. Anyway, good luck and uh, we are going to, uh, to have uh, an oc another occasion to, uh, to talk or to communicate. Okay.